네, 어, 코리아 스타트업 포럼의 국제업무 전문의를 맡고 있는 최재형입니다. 네, 반갑습니다. 어, 이렇게 마지막까지 자리를 지켜주신 여러분 진심으로 감사드리고 어, 지금 많은 분들이 나가셨지만 그래도 마지막 콘텐츠가 그래도 여기 있는 모든 분들에게 유익한 콘텐츠가 되었으면 하는 바람으로 네, 최선을 다해서 이번 세션을 진행해 보도록 하겠습니다. <웃음> 그 오신 분들이 굉장히 이제 바다 건너서 멀리서 오셨고 또 이분들이 한국어가 모국어가 아니기 때문에 어, 좀 진행을 가능하면 이제 영어로 진행을 하도록 하겠고요. 어, 원활한 패널 디스커션을 위해서 영어로 진행을 하고 어, 동시 통역이 제공되니까 예, 동시 통역으로 어, 한글이 편하신 분들은 한글로 들으시면 될것 같습니다. Okay, so as none of you guys actually have native Korean speakers, I'm going to uh, lead this session in Cor uh, not Korean in English. in order to facilitate, facilitate our discussion here. Okay, so basically I think you guys already briefly introduced yourself before just you presented uh, your presentation. Also, we, have, we don't have really much time, so in, yeah. So in order to be more efficient, I'm going to uh, directly move on several actually questions that I would like to ask you to uh, commonly, and maybe uh, we can also get some questions from the audience as well. Okay, so basically, you know, the, I think that there are three keywords in this conference. Basically, one is innovation, the other one is digital economy, and the thirdly, unicorns, basically also the startup, right? So, uh, I just wanted to ask a question related to the first keyword, innovation. Okay, so I think, you know, the innovation uh, can be you know, defined in very various ways in different countries, depending on their economic and social status. For example, in some countries, probably people would be more excited about, you know, like Uber flying taxis or something. But in some other countries, for example, in Rwanda and Africa, probably people will think uh, like, you know, the blood delivery in a drone, which can save thousands of people's lives living in a mountainous area where ambulance is not accessible, will be much more innovative. So I think, uh, Innovation is something that we can define you know, depending on your you know, specific situation. So I wonder, in your country, what is the area with, uh, which you think needs innovation the most? And how do you think startups can help overcome several challenges and innovate that area? So uh, maybe we can start from uh, Edward. Yeah. Sure. So Indonesia, as we see on my presentation before, that the spending is a lot on the consumer side. Yeah, so the innovation, as you see a lot of this unicorn coming from Indonesia in a travel, in the e-marketplaces, and also in payment, uh, they are all actually solving the problem of the consumer at this moment. And if, you know, probably unlike the, uh, you know, Korea or uh, uh, countries whereby the infrastructure of, uh, you know, scientists can actually flourish, in Indonesia there is an issue for that. For example, uh, you know, my personal, my own brother uh, that is in Santa Clara right now, he graduated um, with a PhD in the, you know, PLSI. So it's creating chips, right? So it's difficult for him to go back to Indonesia because there's, there isn't infrastructure to innovate. Uh, we don't have the infrastructure to create chips, you know. So basically, you know, my stand on the Indonesian innovation at this moment we are still in the consumer or as the market, you know, but it will evolve from there. Yes, so from the Malaysian context, um, it, it's very hard for us to identify exactly where we need innovation the most, but it is very clear to us like which area, if you had innovation in, it would make the biggest change for the country. So, um, but by that I mean, we are very American-centric in the way that we consume media. So we're very influenced by what we see happening in Silicon Valley and in the US. So depending on what kind of things are covered, then different things are in a way like quote-unquote sexy in Malaysia. So when AI is hot in the US, AI is suddenly hot in, in Malaysia. When blockchain is popular, everybody wants to do blockchain. This is one dynamic. And the other dynamic is obviously that we're really an economy of politics and personality. So as much as we're proud of the MSC uh, of being thought of by, at that, at that point, uh, a 60-year-old leader of, the, of, uh, of a country, it is also the biggest point of risk, which is that when you have an initiative which is led by a personality, when that personality then moves out of office, then the next person tends to not want to continue that because it's defined by the personality that, that championed it. 
So really, what's missing in our economy, and uh, this might be true for, for other governments, is to be data-driven. And so the biggest innovation that we see has to be on the data layer, and especially on government data, so that the government can make decisions based on not just sentiment, but real hard figures. And I say that knowing that this is probably the biggest challenge that anybody, whether a government agency or a private company in Malaysia would face. Because to convince them to adopt data, number one, there's a huge transition process. And number two, what happens in the eventuality when the data doesn't correspond to what they want? Right? When, because oftentimes, you go, you go and look for data that confirms your bias. But that's how you end up planning a city, ro a, a city wrongly. I'll give you an example. In, in the 1990s, we, we rolled out the light railway transit. Until today, there are some stations that when you get off, you wonder like, why is there a station here? There's nowhere for me to go. Because it wasn't planned based on data, it was planned with other factors. Politics and, um, and kind of manifestos and promises that were made to people or business development, but it was never followed through. So if we could have very data-driven policies and decisions led in the country, I think we would have a very different path of development. Yes, uh, this question, since it's in the heart of my career for the past 20 years, because I still teach on innovation theory, uh, we identify seven specific types of innovations that uh, Thailand should uh, emphasize on. Uh, the first one is on paradigm innovation. Uh, because uh, a lot of people think about innovation like a linear model, research developments and innovation, uh, which is not uh, sufficient, uh, particularly when we're talking about a new economy concept, whether it's digital economies or data economies or whatever economies. Uh, innovations not only come from research and development. That's why we would like to uh, emphasize on how paradigm shift could be happened in the universities or in even younger in the, in the school. This is the first uh, innovations that uh, we're aiming for. The second one, because we have quite a few number of uh, problems quite similar to Indonesia. Uh, every year we have uh, Northern Five and we cannot figure out who it come from and we have a lot of problems regarding to PM 2.5. Early the, uh, in early in the summer, it's, it come from Thailand. At the end of the year, it come from Indonesia, you can see that. This is not only one country's problem. That's why green innovation is very important. The second one is about public sector innovation because at this moment, uh, the government decided to transform the government to be the accelerator for innovation. That's why quite a few numbers of public services, uh, they need to reconsider and, and, and renew the way they treat the people. So this is the third innovation that we have emphasized on. And also area-based innovation, that's why we try to decentralize uh, the opportunities of innovations all around the countries. And again, we are not that much emphasized on product and service innovation, but rather as business model innovation. Particularly, so you can see that uh, the corporate, the big corporate in Thailand, they are very strong on business model innovation. Why we would like startups to come up with a very robust business model. Also, data driven innovation, and this is a big thing for OECD. Uh, when we're talking about digital economy, we're talking about uh, privacy, but how we can utilize uh, the, the data, the existing data, not only from the, the government, but also from the users. As you already knew about user generated data, how we can have more creativity and uh, so called some specific ideologies or idea to translate uh, that into a new opportunity for new, new innovations. And the last one is social innovation. This is very big things at this moment because uh, social enterprise and corporate uh, that's transformed themselves from C C CSV into some specific and more radical uh, ideas on how they contribute to the social. That's why social innovation is another big thing in Thailand at this moment. Well, thank you very much. Well, as you guys already you know, presented, I can see you know, each country has a different level of challenges and different you know, aspects of challenge and everything. So the um, so next question is about 
some kind of internal collaboration between the ASEAN countries because you know, those challenges that you mentioned, uh, I don't think it's not something that you guys can you know, solve by yourself. So you definitely need some kind of international collaboration. But also, I can see several some kind of competitiveness you know, between the Asian community and countries. So uh, basically, you know, I think you know, the Asian community itself has a really huge economic potential. So in order to maximize the this potential of economic power and also solve the challenges you know, mutually, and then also can get some kind of mutual benefit. I uh, just would like to know more about uh, certain kind of a collaborative initiatives and programs which are already existing, or is there anything you would like to propose to you know, uh, the Asian community that, okay, this kind of initiative program is needed to you know, solve the challenge in, your, in the country? So basically, these two questions, if there is any, and please, you know, introduce us about any collaborative initiative between the Asian community, Asian countries, and if there is anything you would like to propose, and then this is something also that you can propose as an idea. So maybe uh, now uh, we can start from the other, the other round. <laughs> yes, uh, I have slides. Uh, fortunately, again, uh, because this year uh, Thailand is was was just finished our ASEAN presidency uh, a couple of weeks ago, but before that, we just launched uh, a, a new initiative for startups, uh, particularly for ASEAN countries and our close friends. Uh, we call CISA, Southeast Asia uh, Startup Assembly, mainly f focus on uh, startup activities, the corporations between the, the the government in each national that uh, supporting startup and also venture capital, including some specific cities that can work uh, alongside. That's why we uh, announced Bangkok Innovations and Startup Declaration uh, this June. No, sorry, this July. Uh, at this moment, uh, we have uh, around, uh, I think, more than ten countries already. We have Cambodia, Brunei, Indonesia, uh, China, uh, Japan, uh, Laos, Malaysia, and we have uh, our friend from Central Asia, Kazakhstan, to join. And we hope that uh, in the near future, we can have South Korea to join as well. We have Myanmar and Vietnam and Singapore, definitely. So we successfully uh, launched our first meeting focused only among the government agencies that support startups. So we plan for the next year, uh, I think in Vietnam, Vietnam will be uh, the, the next presidency. We will incorporate uh, the roles of corporate and also venture capital fund in the region. Uh, we will have at least two panels, a panel for the government to share. This year we start sharing uh, the policies and the ecosystem and also uh, similar challenges that we can work together. For example, sharing data, creating trust among uh, startups that would like to penetrate uh, along uh, Southeast Asian markets so that uh, each uh, counterpart can bring in information and exchange uh, some specific uh, insight so that uh, uh, our key member country startups can work together faster. So in that sense, uh, we believe that uh, CISA or Southeast Asian uh, Startup uh, Assembly will act as a, a bridge between ASEAN and the rest of the world, not only uh, ASEAN plus three, maybe plus plus plus. So this is uh, the contributions of uh, Thailand as uh, ASEAN presidency. So um, I think I concur. Like. We, we are the, the conduit on the Malaysian side for CISA, and we, we will do our best to support and uh, collaborate on that. Uh, you know, we have this natural platform called ASEAN, where the countries come together and try to collaborate. But I also have my own criticisms of the platform, which is that it's still so high level that sometimes you come up with an idea. Number one, it's very slow because it's G2G, right? And of course, we live in a world and time now that companies want it immediately. Startups want to move very fast. So, and you also have, when you require multiple countries to work together, um, 
then the efforts are never uh, commensurated, right? So one country may do more, and, and I think oftentimes the host company that, that the host country that proposes ends up doing more. I think there's um, ASEAN TV that I think the last time Thailand, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the last time Thailand shared ASEAN, they, they launched this as a channel to promote ASEAN tourism. But now you go on there, I think like 99% of the content is Thai. Not because Thailand wanted it for themselves, but because when you require inter, inter-nation kind of like collaboration, there are multiple hurdles that you're going to face. So we will continue to be supportive. We also have to look at it from another angle, which is maybe it's not really a G2G thing that we have to foster. What's the most meaningful thing for businesses? So I believe businesses really want two things, to uh, invoice for money and get their money fast, right? when they build. And because we're, we're one of the countries who are trying to advocate for a lot of um, cross-border trade, so we're trying to get e-invoicing, so that's why I, I alluded to in my, in, um, in my presentation. E-invoicing, if we can get it right in Malaysia and get adoption at mass in Malaysia, if we can do it regionally, all businesses will be trading more efficiently and money will be flowing faster between the regions. I think businesses will be happy. Um, I want to point out that you know this is not a Malaysian initiative. We're not coming up with the framework or the protocol. In fact, we were lucky because the first com- country in ASEAN to adopt it was Singapore. And if Singapore came out with their own protocol, I think for sure nobody, nobody else in ASEAN because they're going to say, it's a Singapore one, you know, why we'll also invent our own one. But I think when Singapore adopted an open global standard, then it made it also easier for us to say, okay, we're going to work together with Singapore to do this. And this might be a model that is more workable within the ASEAN context, that ASEAN member nations adopt something which is neutral, but beneficial almost immediately or, or faster to the businesses. Um, the, se- the second thing I, I would say is that, you know, I, I think as, as we alluded to kind of sharing data, it will come, I think, in time. But of course, internally, we have to get our eggs together so that we can actually collect data that we can share. So I think even before sharing data, let's share plans. Because, you know, today I was very impressed by the plans of Thailand. I mean, all of these different you know, corridors, the different areas where you're developing different parts of tech. To be honest, I haven't spent that much time in Thailand, but when I saw this, I'm like, wow, these are amazing plans. How could we collaborate? So, in fact, this year, we will actually work quite closely with a, with a Thai agency that's planning the digital economy called DIPA. And it's actually a departure from, very different from how we used to behave. So I've only been in MDEC for seven months, and I like to be very open. So when when they came, I said, let's tell them all of our plans. And a lot of the, my colleagues were saying, oh, but our plans are not final, we can't share them yet. No, we should. We should just tell them it's not final, it will evolve, and we'll keep in contact as they evolve. And I think as we innovate and plan together, we might end up in a future where our plans are taking into account all the other developments within ASEAN. So that, I think, may, may make it easier and a bit more feasible. Because I think to be rely on a very high-level G2G, we, I think at the end of the day, we have to be very practical and realize that it's still a human being that's representing us. How much do you expect a minister or a prime minister to know everything about your, your industry so that he can convince another minister that then has to understand it and then implement it on, on their counterpart? So some of them sound great on paper, but I think today we live in a day and age that businesses and people want real results yeah, I, I think ultimately they want it really quick. So I think we should be more pragmatic about how we do this. Yeah, I think uh, as of now, yeah, the collaboration has already started, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the sharing from Pound, uh, in from Thailand and also Faisal is uh, a lot of uh, something that we can learn, you know. As far as Indonesia, we are actually quite behind uh, in terms of the setup of the fund or the sovereign fund. Uh, Singapore, you know, they have uh, Temasek, yeah? uh, GIC, and also Malaysia, Kasana, uh, Thailand. Uh, also, I believe you you have. Right? So Indonesia, we we still don't have these what's so called this uh, sovereign fund. Yeah? And then the roadmap itself is still you know in silo in every ministry. So hopefully, um, you know, as a foundation, we can bring in together, and then probably uh, the following year we are able to share and together with the other countries. But uh, definitely Indonesia is a very attractive market 
Yeah? And also a lot of innovation has already happened, but there is no central database that we are able to track. So this is something that we are uh, possibly or potentially can collaborate. Yeah? Some of the innovation made by our scientists or even uh, players in the market may not be uh, thought of by other country. Um, but the solution could be in Korea, for example. You know? So those kind of needs database uh, need to be shared. Yeah? So uh, I think it's also a plan of Mexicon if we are able to create those database um, whereby each player startups, uh, when they find some uh, potential uh, intellectual properties, they're able to file it in, in certain database or portal of us, and then we are able to share it with uh, other countries. And, you know, uh, as for example, in Korea, you have more infrastructure, say, you know, creating uh, the infrastructure to create chips. Yeah. Uh, definitely from the software side, we, are, we, we need to create chips to accelerate the you know, computing power and everything, right? So if you don't have that, um, we are unable to step up. Yeah. So those kind of uh, collaboration, also like in Taiwan, I know that you know they're uh, also in Korea. Of course, uh, the, the manufacturing side, the CNCs, um, you know, it's when when we are we want to innovate more, like in agriculture, a lot of machineries. Uh, yeah, we need those infrastructure to create the product. Yeah, so. Those type of collaboration, I think, would be good, uh, sharing the, the database. And also, uh, with the Nexicon right now, I think having, you know, inviting more G2G into our platform, you will be able to see the uh, Indonesian startup and the next unicorn. We curate those startups, so you see the cream on the crops of the startup in Indonesia. Definitely, you can learn a lot uh, from Indonesia startup by attending this Nexicon. Well, thank you very much. Um, basically, well, you know, I'm quite impressed that you know that you guys already you know are starting you know a lot of interesting you know, collaboration because if you look at you know our neighboring countries like you know Korea and China and Japan, we got a lot of lot of problem you know, <laughs> a lot of conflict and then so but you know you guys probably I I think you know, you know trying to find some kind of clue to make a really harmonized you know development and you know, harmonized you know, growth that's really fantastic to hear. Um, so, uh, before moving on, uh, 여기 계신 분들 그 심플로우로 질문들을 좀 올려주시면 좋을 것 같습니다. 지금 다들 아, 묻고 있는 것 같은데 그 뒤에 여기 이거 찍으시면 이제 질문들을 올리실 수가 있는데 예, 그래서 저희가 이 심플로우를 지금 계속해서 아직 사용을 못 하고 있어요. 그래서 이 심플로우로 질문을 올려주시면 제가 이따가 질문들을 보고 또그 객석에서 나온 질문들을 이분들께 드리도록 하겠습니다. Okay. So, Edward, you uh, give us a little bit of a glimpse into the, some kind of potential collaboration between ASEAN community and another country outside of, uh, you know, Asian community, like, for example, South Korea or Taiwan or Japan or China, etc. All right. So, uh, in addition to the actual internal collaboration between the Asian countries that you guys already mentioned, I also would like to explore a certain possible collaboration uh, between specifically South Korea an Asian community. Actually, this is why actually we held, you know, we hold uh, this kind of session. So, uh, just let me give you a little bit of background information here. Actually, South Korea government launched the uh, National Committee on the New Southern Policy under the direct uh, supervision of the President of the Republic of Korea just a couple of years ago. And I will just introduce several missions of the committee. So I just wrote down just two things which I believe are pretty much related to your work areas and also this conference topic. The first one is improving innovative growth competencies through new industry and smart cooperation. And then also there is uh, another mission called actively participating in the development of infrastructure aimed at greater connectivity. So this is some kind of mission that the National Committee on Southern, uh, uh, New Southern Policy actually is led by the South Korean government. So. Uh, Having said that, you know, that they would also would like to hear the voice from the Asian community in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the what kinds of, uh, you know, collaboration model that, you know, you can expect the Korean government or enterprise and startups to participate in and contribute uh, for the innovation growth in your country, also in your regions, and then what kind of collaboration would you like to propose? So maybe now we can start from middle, so <laughs> this time, yeah. Sure, I, I think, um, 
maybe this question will be easier to answer in one week's time because next week we'll have the ASEAN ROC, uh, where the ASEAN member countries are being hosted here, I believe, in Busan. So I believe the heads of the states will have uh, kind of a clear directive in terms of where at a national level, what kind of collaborations the governments are looking at. I think speaking from the Malaysian perspective, specifically for the ICT sector, uh, we definitely believe that economies like South Korea um, are superior in certain technological applications, right? So of course, there's a global name like Samsung, everybody knows Samsung, but also if you look at it, Hana Bank or Shin Han Bank, uh, the different innovations within their sectors, banking and fintech. So um, I think because we, we operate within different environments, uh, there are some environments which are already a bit further uh, ahead in South Korea. So um, for example, in Malaysia, hopefully in the, the middle of 2020, our central bank will announce a uh, digital banking license. So financial sector is very sensitive in Malaysia because almost everything is regulated. I mean, I'm sure it's also regulated here in South Korea, but we are over-regulated because we're, we have a high uh, rate of, um, of abuse, right? I think in the 1990s, Malaysia held the record for the highest incidence of credit card fraud. So our people are very smart, but very smart at doing the, the wrong things, I think, right? Or, or rather, people who want to do the wrong things tend to want to come to Malaysia. So we, we are very defensive and overprotective of our financial sector, so when we move into something like digital banking, uh, we look at economies like South Korea that have already some experience. We, we of course, we understand that because a lot of these technologies are new, you're not going to have 20 years more experience than us. Uh, but sometimes in the digital age, even three or four years more experience, because everything moves so fast, it makes it significantly different. And of course, from our point of view, it comes back down to our citizens. The innovation is one part, but how did you get the adoption? How, how did you make sure that people understood the technology and understood how to do it, to use it properly uh, and in, in a way that conforms to, I, I believe, like how the regulations might be thought of? So I think for those are areas that we at MDEC, um, especially for the digital economy or the ICT sector, are very keen to collaborate with, uh, with South Korea. I'm editing the, the agenda for my minister now. <laughs> uh, there are four specific uh, agendas that uh, we are going to discuss next, next week, following uh, from uh, the visit of the president of Korea to Thailand a couple of months ago. Right now, we have around three uh, MOUs, uh, one with Lotte, uh, others with uh, the government agencies, COSME, and also with the uh, city of Daegu. There are four specific areas that uh, we um, strive for uh, deep relationships and collaboration. Uh, the first one is on uh, the seek for uh, new co-founders. It's, it's not necessary to be among Thai or Korean co-founders, either it's from universities or from, from startups that's already I mean, operate. That can be for the rest of Southeast Asian, that we would like to have more uh, co-founding uh, companies between Southeast Asia and uh, Korea. The second one is uh, the collaboration between the cities, as I mentioned earlier, particularly uh, South, uh, in, in South Korea, Seoul and Daegu, and also Busan. Uh, the third one is uh, collaboration between uh, corporate venture capital in Thailand and also with the uh, VC uh, communities in, in Korea. And the last one is on uh, deep technology development. So there are four areas of cooperation that uh, we are uh, working on uh, for the next week. Okay. Uh, two things that I think the collaboration uh, very important, especially for Indonesia right now is the uh, one is like uh, Fan mentioned about the corporate venture capitals coming into Indonesia. As we know that in Indonesia, there's a lot of collaboration happening already, but it's between the uh, conglomerates and also the corporation in Korea coming into Indonesia. So they already set up uh, the joint ventures and everything. But as we know that uh, even these enterprises in Indonesia, they're uh, you know are, are undergoing a digital transformation and. 
a lot of this digital transformation is coming from these uh, startup ecosystems, and whereby those uh, most of the conglomerates in Indonesia right now they create their own VC arms. You know, so there's a lot of potentials that we can work together uh, instead of uh, you know big firms and big firms uh, working together. Uh, is big firms and work together with the startups in Indonesia. And the second thing is very important to us is the educations. So some of the initiatives already happening uh, in the Ministry of uh, Communication and Information, whereby we are sending, uh, uh, you know, potential uh, uh, students. I mean, uh, students for potential startups to Tsinghua uh, University in China and also uh, MIT. So we have a program for them, uh, even for the, uh, uh, you know, the employees, you know, the government employees to study there. You know, so I think it's good to also expose them. Uh, to work with, together with these, um, you know, high uh, prominent universities in Korea, so they're uh, aware of uh, the development and also the progress that is happening in Korea. So I think th those two things is, uh, you know, something that we can work together. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, actually, while you guys are speaking, there are several questions coming in. It's great news. Okay, but actually we have very limited time here. I think just around three minutes left or something. So I'm gonna choose kind of a simple question, right? Because there is some kind of interesting but kind of serious question that we need a lot of time to discuss. So maybe there's something you guys can also discuss during the networking dinner together with the, uh, some of the uh, governmental you know, officials actually uh, who are present here. So uh, basically this is question Here we go. Oh, yeah, should I? Oh, yeah, I have to interpret it, okay. <laughs> so basically, well, uh, when you think about some kind of relationship between the uh, South Korean and Asian community, uh, most of the people think that in you know, a Korean enterprise government actually penetrate your market, but why don't we think about some kind of the other way around? You know, uh, what about actually the penetrating Korean market from Asian you know, country based you know, startups or companies? and then. Uh, what kind of a business model you think is possible for ASEAN community-based you know, enterprise to you know, uh, export their business model into Korean market? And also, what kind of condition do you think is needed, if I interpret correctly? Okay, so maybe, yeah, anyone who would like to answer the questions? And yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be... Yeah, uh, maybe before I answer, I can say, like, I think South Korean companies don't just penetrate the Malaysian market, but they definitely also have penetrated until my living room because uh, my son is seven years old and I think almost every day for the last seven years, I listen to Baby Shark, right? Which is uh, Pink Fox, I believe is a South Korean company. Uh, so we actually had a group of companies from South Korea come uh, visit us last year and there was a similar, um, similar question posed. You know, how do Malaysian companies uh, go out of South Korea? So I think maybe one of the things I can point out that maybe, maybe it's not so obvious to Korean companies is that uh, it's a market that we don't really understand too well. So I think, the, you know, when you look at Southeast Asia, uh, it looks, it's, the perception seems simple, which is that these 10 countries are developing, right? So they're not advanced like a US or a, or a Western European uh, economy. Uh, there's a lot of innovation because they're early in the development. Um, and so when you're sitting in Southeast Asia and you look at Japan and Korea, you think, wow, they're so technological. Right? That I think a lot of fear is that whatever we want to do, they probably already thought of. And then you have to understand that, of, of course, when we go and buy electronics, we see Korean brands and Japanese brands. So we always think technologically, a lot of these economies are ahead of us. So I believe that a lot of collaboration that would happen would be largely export based on things that we are going to, prop we assume is going to be things that we supply into your value chain rather than end consumable. So when maybe Samsung is going to sell me a TV, a lot of the times the perception from a Southeast Asian country is that we're going to supply some component or, or um, some product which is going to make up a television eventually in the, in the downstream. So that's a perception that I think a lot of businesses have in Malaysia. I'm not sure whether it, that's true across ASEAN, but that certainly for us, we, we feel that this is a, a market which is further down the value chain, so we might be playing in the upstream on the commodity side. Mm. That's a very interesting point. Okay, yeah. 
You want to add something more? Yeah. I think we successfully penetrated Korean market. Thank you to receive Lisa uh, at the Blackpink. I think you know about Blackpink, right? Lisa. Nichakun uh, from 2 p.m. So in that sense, uh, we successfully penetrated uh, Korean market in a sense. And uh, I think uh, when, when we're talking about the models, there are three specific areas that we need to, to consider. The first one is on uh, the, the platforms that work between uh, the ASEAN countries and Korea regarding to landing and launching pads. This is very important because uh, uh, if we have uh, similar agreements and platforms, like uh, st st startup or in Thailand we call smart visa, startup visa that uh, regulated and also scouting by the government, and you have a very close relationship with ecosystem builder in that countries or the cities, then it will be very very easy to to share the different business model and mindset. So in that sense, uh, you can see that uh, the launching and landing pad can see it has a very e crucial mechanism. That's the first one. The second one, I think, uh, the culture. I think, to some extent, uh, the Asia Pacific culture, particularly uh, uh, the, the cultures all around North and East Asia, North and Southeast Asia is quite similar to some extent, but the language barrier is very, this is very, very maintainful. Uh, even we, we speak English, but to some extent, when you talk in English, you have different uh, so called interpretation in your own language. Communication barrier. And the last one, rules and regulation. For example, at this moment, uh, in Thailand, we are, we're having a, a lot of discussion with uh, the, the law tech uh, startup and also the lawyer association that we will start to translate corporate laws or even some specific laws regarding to the companies, particularly startup that would like to, to, to land in, in some specific countries. At least they need to understand their basic laws in their own language. That's why we start to, to work on uh, uh, the technology like uh, natural language so that uh, it will increase the, the speed of translation. This is very important because it's too technical for startup. Yes, uh, just a quick one. It's, um, yeah, actually, we work together uh, already with the uh, Korean uh, firms in, because. Uh, uh, my venture capital also invested in operating holding for what we call ideal source entertainment that will be uh, listed uh, next year or 2021. So we actually work with uh, CJ Entertainment, uh, you know, one script that is actually uh, proven in Korea, and then we import it to Indonesia, and then we create uh, the, the movie in an Indonesian version, you know, and I believe that Lotte is also coming to Indonesia and work with the local partner also. So, yeah, that's one collaboration that uh, I know is happening right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Especially, I uh, didn't think about in the K-pop role as a bridge between these two different communities, and that was a very fascinating point. Okay, so uh, we can actually close this session, and then thank you very, very much for all your contribution, and then please you know, uh, applaud for all our uh, panelists here. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 감사합니다. 자, 이렇게 해서 하나 센트 페어 세션 토론까지 함께 하셨습니다.